Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. You know, we have folks tuned in from lots of different parts of the world. Super excited to be in conversation with you all today. Before we get started, we want to just share that we do have interpretation for this meeting. I'm going to really briefly just share um, some quick instructions and we'll have our trans uh our translating folks also be saying this in Spanish but if you are interested in interpretation there is the interpretation button where all the little buttons exist right next to the reactions one as you can see in the picture and you can click directly on either the English channel or the Spanish channel. I'm gonna give everyone a quick minute to choose which channel you'd like to be tuned into. Buenas, gracias a todos por estar acá. Eh, antes de comenzar, vamos a hacer este anuncio de que va a haber interpretación simultánea entre español e inglés. El programa de hoy es mayormente en inglés, aunque pueden hacer sus preguntas en español. Y para accesar la interpretación al español, pueden ir a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde hay un icono de un globo terráqueo. Ahí pueden hacer clic o escoger en el menú eh, la opción de español para escuchar el, el evento de hoy en español. Eh, si están en un teléfono o una tableta, el menú es similar, solo que al final deben eh, hacer clic en finalizar o done para que entonces sí se active. Si usted es plenamente bilingüe, eh, siéntase en la comodidad de eh, dejarlo eh, apagado o escuchar simplemente en el audio original. Cualquier pregunta sobre la interpretación pueden hacerla en el chat para asegurarnos que se esté escuchando correctamente. Gracias. Thank you. If folks have any other additional questions on interpretation, please feel free to just drop them in the chat. Um, and as we get started, um, just some quick etiquette. We know that a lot of us um, are have experienced Zoom fatigue of just being on screens, but I'm really personally excited for today's conversation, um, almost on a selfish note, to hear all the brilliance of our panelists and all of the strategies and creative ways in which they're combating some really dangerous trends happening in all corners of the world. So we also want to encourage you all to participate, be part of this conversation, use the chat, and sort of weave in your own comments and your own reflections. And I also have to remind myself to speak slower for the interpretation. So we'll get started. Um, I want to welcome you all. Um, this is a webinar that we are putting together here at Partners for Dignity and Rights. If you are not familiar with our organization, we are a national organization that works with base building organizations, coalition networks, grassroots groups, working on many different issues from co-governance, worker rights, education equity, public goods, expanding democracy, and more. And we're bringing you all this webinar on behalf of our new social contract, which is focusing on co-governance, specifically policy and organizing models that work either inside or outside of government to shift governing powers towards people who are directly impacted and who have the biggest stake in making sure that our communities and our societies work for everyone. If you are unfamiliar to that term co-governance that I've thrown around a little bit so far, for us co-governance is a collection of participatory models and practices in which government and communities work together through either formal or informal structures to make collective policy decisions and co-create programs to meet community needs and to also ensure that those policies and programs are co-implemented effectively. 
for us, a prerequisite for co-governance is the existence of community-based organizations, be it civic associations, worker centers, tenant organizations, or other organizations that are member-driven and member-led. As we all know, the climate crisis is deepening and impacting all of our realities. And in this, the issue of energy is becoming more and more urgent every day. And although we know that energy is a human right and we know that it should be sustainable, reliable and affordable, that isn't necessarily the case. And it isn't necessarily the case for communities that are most impacted, be it working class, black, brown, indigenous communities which lends us to think that we need local control over energy choices, like where it comes from, how much does it cost? And energy democracy is one of those tools that focuses on energy that is decentralized, dem democratized, and redistributed. And because energy is so often included and the decisions around energy are so often including various government entities, be it local and state agencies, energy commissions and state legislation, we do recognize that government's a terrain that we simply cannot ignore. We have to struggle within it and wield power in it. And co-governance is one of those important strategies towards energy democracy. It speaks directly to the need for community input and decision-making power in these choices that affect each of us in the most basic level, whether the lights are on, whether we stay warm in the winter, whether we can access internet, cook for our families, and so much more. And everyone should have a say about where their energy comes from, who controls it, and how it's paid for Which makes me feel very excited for this webinar because um, each panelists, um, here has worked in many different ways um, towards establishing and making energy democracy more of a reality in Puerto Rico and Malacay. I want to introduce our speakers today. Cruz Santiago is a renowned environmental lawyer and activist who has been fighting on so many fronts in Puerto Rico, pushing back on dirty fossil fuel plants that have been polluting neighborhoods for years, advocating for a stronger community say on the public utility and fighting against disaster capitalism post Hurricane Maria and demanding that billions of FEMA dollars go to the communities that need them to build sustainable energy systems instead of corporations whose only interest is making money. We also have Kiani Rollins Hernandez, who's a Kupayana of Malakai, a descendant of the first Polynesians that made Hawaii home. She's a member of the Maui County Council where she holds a Malachi residency seat and represents everyone countywide. She has fought to ensure that her community's voice is at the center of decision-making and has been advocating for local control over their energy on Malachi. And lastly, but certainly not least, we are joined by Todd Yamashita, who is a fourth generation resident of Malachi and helped found the Oahu Energy Cooperative in Malachi, which is committed to creating resilient, sustainable, equitable, and culturally conscious energy for all. Um, we can give them a warm welcome. If we were all in the same space, it would be a room full of um, applauses. Very, very excited. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for saying yes and being part of this conversation. I think I wanna start off um, with you, Ruth. Um, and this one's a personal question, too, because I'm also Puerto, Puerto Rican. Um, many folks actually don't know what I'm about to say, but Puerto Ricans actually face some of the highest energy costs in the, in the country. Um, and of course, we know that poor communities, Black and brown communities, are bearing the brunt of the toxic pollution generated by the fossil fuel industry on the island. It's a question for you, Ruth. What would energy democracy look like in Puerto Rico? What needs to change? What do we need to focus on? So hi, everyone. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for the, the question. Um, so I, I want to say I'm based here in Salinas, Puerto Rico, which is the site of the largest electrical facility in PR, and it's um, adjacent to uh, the site of the AES coal-fired power plant. Between the two of them, those are the um, most polluting power plants in Puerto Rico. And um, there's uh, some 
another two polluting, big polluting power plants in southwestern Puerto Rico. So a lot of the dirty um, energy generation in Puerto Rico, very centralized, is overburdening communities, mostly in southern Puerto Rico and providing energy mostly for like the San Juan metro area in the north. Um, and so, of course, we have, you know, a classic um, environmental injustice situation of the overburdening of the communities that are close to these plants in every way that you might imagine, not just the, you know, you think of what's coming out of the stacks, but also think about, especially with the AES coal-fired power plant, coal ash waste, which is very toxic um, combination of heavy metals and radioactive um, isotopes. And um, think of water pollution, think of uh, thermal discharges into our nearby bay. You know, we have of course, Puerto Rico is an archipelago um, with uh, 44 municipalities that are coastal. And so, um, yeah, these plants just charging um, all kinds of pollutants into the water um, certainly does not help the situation. And so I think energy democracy in our context here in Puerto Rico, and especially after the experiences with not only Hurricane Maria, Inma Maria, the hurricanes in 2017, but also Hurricane Fiona, in uh, 2019 is that communities need to become energy literate, learn about um, energy issues and um, become participants, active agents, not just passive consumers of energy. Um, and some people use the term prosumers, that is uh, producers and, and at the same time consumers of energy. And so, of course, that I think that's the main element, right, of becoming uh, literate, aware, educated, and part of energy uh, generation and distribution and um, ownership. And um, we do have a public utility here. It's called the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority that now is basically in name only um, because a lot of the uh, functions uh, of the of PREPA, as we know, it had been stripped off and, and privatized in the past few years. And um, the the thinking behind that was that it was going to make the system better, somehow more efficient and provide better service. That has not turned out to be the case at all. And so, yeah, we need to continue to work with organized communities. Um, we're doing pilot, like especially rooftop solar projects and proposing, and we have civil society proposals for the radical transformation of the electric system here. Um, that of course is based on not just the technological switch and you know overcoming this narrative that only big centralized you know, foreign corporations can be part of electric systems or can determine decisions in electric supply and uh, distribution, et cetera, but that uh, that the, the narrative now no longer holds in light of a lot of things that um, involve not just technology, but also uh, governance issues, right? Um, communities being able to participate in the actual decision-making. So I, I guess I should leave it there for now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really rich start. Thank you, Ruth. And it makes me think a lot about just like the con what's possible in, in our community's transformation when we are able to actually organize towards A, what we know we deserve, but also this idea of challenging like these neo-colonial narratives that we can only um, power communities by these foreign corporations when actually we know that they're quite inefficient. And yeah, I really appreciate you um, bringing that point up. Um, my next question, Kiani. Um, we know that Puerto Rico and Hawaii um, have some diff some parallels, but there's also different contexts. And I think that's what makes this conversation so expansive. So, County, can you tell us a little bit of Malakai, the island that you represent on the Maui County Council? What's the community like? What makes it unique? And what is your vision for energy democracy? And Mahalo for that question. Aloha mai kako, mai molokai nui ahina. Uh, and mahalo for those new terms, uh, Ruth. I love them. I'm going to add them to my, <laughs> my list. Um, so Molokai is, um, you know, the Molokai, that, the island that has fed me, that has nourished me, 
uh, is one of the seven inhabited islands in the Hawaiian um, archipelago uh, that includes over 130 uh, islands, atolls, reefs, shallow bank shoals, and seamounts stretching over 1,500 miles. Um, it's one of four of the islands in our county, and um, it's the only county uh, like it um, in Hawaii. Uh, there are no traffic lights on our island, uh, and it's like stepping back in time by 100 years for those that uh, live on the other islands. Uh, and we also pay some of the highest rates uh, in Hawaii uh, and compared to those in America. Uh, our population is around 7,500 uh, people. Over 60% are Native Hawaiian, uh, compared to the statewide percentage of about 21%. Uh, most of our community members are from families that have lived here for generations, uh, like Todd's, uh, including those who were brought here to uh, work on sugar plantations. Uh, this enables us to continue to practice uh, the practices of our kupuna, our ancestors, uh, and to maintain a kinship to our aina, um, our land, our home. Uh, here it is said that uh, aina is a uh, chief, that aina is our ancestor, both metaphorically and literally, where the bones of our ancestors are indistinguishable from the soil which feeds us. Our ancestors continue to feed us. I highlight this as foundational to our culture. This relationship informs how decisions shaping our future is made. Ikava ma mua, ikava ma hope. Our future is found in our past. Um, our vision for energy justice, energy democracy, and energy independence are rooted in our shared cultural values, including malama aina, uh, where we are not generating energy at the expense of the health and well-being of our environment, including the flora and fauna, um, recognizing that we are all connected and, and play a role in bringing life to each other, ola. Um, aloha ke kahi ke kahi. We care for each other and ensure that we are collectively taking care of each other. Uh, aina momona, and we plan and cultivate a future of abundance for seven generations and beyond um, today by building the systems, both physical infrastructure and social structures necessary. This includes proactive community-based planning for energy systems owned and managed by our community. Decisions made here locally, rates, uh, rates being set by our people, ensuring equity, dividends um, to our community, ensuring that proper investment is made into the physical infrastructure of our, our energy infrastructure to keep our children, to our grandparents and all generations in between safe. Um, and I'm sure Todd will build upon that uh, for the vision of Molokai. Mahalo for that question. Honey, thank you so much for just, uh, it's a really beautiful reminder of also how we're sort of remembering a lot of our ancestors tradition and what it means to be stewards of the land that our folks have been doing for a long time and how that sort of can empower us now to do what we must do. Um, but yeah, I know Todd, you're gonna build on this. And Todd, you were one of the founders of the Wahoo Energy Cooperative in Malachi. And for folks who are not familiar, um, can you tell us just a little bit about why was it needed? Like, why did you all birth that? And, and explain a little bit of how it's working today. Oh, Todd, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm a little rusty. Yeah, so, you know, why as a community uh, uh, did we get into renewable energy and how did we do that? Why is that important? The reason why I, I think you heard it uh, from Kiani, um, you heard her passion. Molokai is a really unique place uh, with a really unique cultural heritage. Um, and it's really one of the last unspoiled places here in Hawaii. Um, the other reason why is because we're getting crushed. Um, and I know Puerto Rico is very similar to Molokai. 
Um, we're about as vulnerable as we, ha we have ever been. And, you know, we look at the fires in Lahaina at the, uh, on Maui next door that have killed over 100 people and um, that was likely caused by the power grid. And we also look at the hurricanes that Puerto Rico has experienced. And um, it, it's, it's trending in the wrong direction. So that's, that's our reason why we're motivated in that direction. Um, luckily, you know, during COVID, uh, we had a lot of downtime as a community. We used Zoom um, to get together. And um, we, th there was a, a, a project that was being released by our utility, and it was a community solar project. And we all took a look at that, and, and we asked some pretty cr critical questions. Um, you know, questions like, why are these projects, you know, that are so critical to our existence as a, as a community, um, why are they planned, financed, and operated by outsiders? Um, and that led us to the next ultra-critical cr question, which is, you know, as a community inexperienced in renewable energy that has no uh, infrastructure and support within renewable energy, is this something that we can try and do? Is it, you know, and, and we actually use this uh, community solar project, which is 2.5 megawatts. Uh, that was our catalyst. We used it as our catalyst uh, to bring vol in volunteer uh, community members together. It took hundreds of community hours um, to plan and bring together. And I, you know, long story short, uh, about two and a half years later, uh, we have 2.5 megawatts of community energy, uh, which is uh, scheduled to uh, start construction as early as next year. Uh, and, and just a little bit about, just a little bit about the project itself. Um, you know, community energy, it takes, it's this idea that, you know, renters and other low income people they're the last to access renewable energy, right? And so the concept is if we build the solar project all in one place, um, can we uh, uh, make subscriptions available, uh, you know, whether you rent or uh, own a home? Uh, and without having to build that system on your house, it allows you to take advantage of renewable energy and help bring the cost down uh, to a, a significant amount. So, um, Anyway, I'm going to stop there because I, I, we, all, we have a lot to talk about. This is my favorite subject. So I, I hope that answered uh, most of your question. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting to sort of hear like what's, what's possible and what's already happening, what's emerging. Um, and very similar to kind of the, to your point, Todd, there is so many similarities to between um, Malachi and what's happening in Puerto Rico. And I think, you know, Ruth, I want to bring it back to you and sort of weave in your perspective also. But, you know, I think so much of what's happening in both of these places, right, not just in Puerto Rico, um, but in both of these places um, are sort of serving as a sort of forecast and a warning um, for us in the States and on the continent of what the future holds. And we know that that means bigger and more frequent natural disasters, which are combined with disaster capitalism. And I wanna hear a little bit, I mean, we've already started to get into the ways in which our communities are fighting back, but Ruth, I wanna hear a little bit about sort of how are folks in Puerto Rico um, building power and actually combating this. And I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about Queremos Sol and the initiative and what y'all have been building. Sure. Um, so I had mentioned about our, our very centralized fossil-fired import-dependent um, electric system, undemocratic electric system. Um, and uh, so obviously, um, even before the, the very um, uh, traumatic hurricanes we had in 2017, um, the groups uh, throughout Puerto Rico were looking for alternatives and um, started meeting and uh, talking amongst ourselves and with faculty members at the University of Puerto Rico and other academics, um, other allies about proposals to transform our electric system. And uh, that's how uh, really uh, we started participating in uh, integrated resource planning um, at the newly created uh, Energy Bureau in Puerto Rico. 
uh, and proposing distributed renewable energy as one uh, sort of the most important alternative for the technical transformation of our electric system. And when I say distributed um, renewable energy, I'm talking mostly about rooftop solar um, because of the advantages that that has. But that, of course, coupled with battery energy storage systems and um, energy efficiency programs, energy conservation, and as I mentioned earlier, of course, energy literacy, because um, we know that people who uh, are not in the energy field need to become uh, uh, sort of educated or uh, about um, handling these like rooftop solar um, systems and, and the batteries, of course. Um, and so after Hurricane Maria, so that was something we were working on prior to the hurricanes. Uh, but after Hurricane Maria, um, there's this all of this interest in Puerto Rico. And, you know, after that devastation of the electric grid and, um, of course, the deaths that were related to many times a lack of power. There were, I think everyone knows, uh, months and months when we did not have power and in some cases close to a year. And so of course that that led to um, a lot of different proposals. We've had proposals from everywhere. I've been at airports and uh, sort of run into people who tell me that they have a proposal to solve the electric system in Puerto Rico, um, which is sort of interesting. But yeah, so locally um, we, just used a lot of the information that especially faculty at the University of Puerto Rico had already developed, had already looked into and, and sort of zeroed in on two uh, basic parts of the, the Queremos Sol proposal, or it, in English, it's We Want Sun. You can look it up. Um, it's online. It's queremosolpr.org. Um, and it's one is the governance aspect of democratizing our um, electric power utility, there are public utility um, with the participation of different sectors within Puerto Rican society, um, including workers, including uh, communities, including environmental groups, et cetera, um, and making it more responsive to the public interest. Um, and then also, of course, including initiatives um, by communities themselves, organized communities doing projects in conjunction with, with PREPA. Um, and then on the technical side, I, I mentioned we, we are talking a lot about um, distributed renewable energy as opposed as to utility scale. And, I, and I'll give you an example. Just today, um, we were at a march this morning because um, Puerto Rico as an archipelago has limited land space and um, a lot of the developers, foreign corporations are coming in and wanting to use that limit, limited coastal plain that we have very narrow coastal plain that surrounds the mountain range in the middle um, to a site utility scale or industrial scale um, solar especially. And so uh, communities that are impacted by this and people who are concerned about sustainability in terms of food production and about the food energy water nexus are concerned about these huge utility scale projects that often and what we've seen so far is that they totally eliminate vegetation, um, alter the terrain, compact the earth um, and, and make um, changes to the topography that um, really creates increased flood levels and increase stormwater discharges into nearby communities and carry lots of sediments that then uh, run into our bay, especially here in, in Salinas and Guayama. And so renewable is not always sustainable. It's not always um, necessarily uh, something that will help communities. And um, so in Queremos Sol, we state very clearly that we favor distributed renewable energy like rooftop solar, on-site solar, using the built environment to site these um, this energy infrastructure, and of course with community participation. I love the reminder that renewable is in 
always sustainable um because i think we're also seeing how a lot of these terms are being sort of co-opted and being manipulated by some of the corporations that are actually doing the most harm so appreciate that um you know i mentioned at, at the sort of top of the webinar and mentioned this word co-governance um that we talk a lot about here at sort of our new social contract and, you know, we often talk about co-governance as one of the strategies towards building a multiracial democracy. And Kiani, for you, I'm curious, you know, as someone who is actually a council member, is actually serving in government, how do you sort of see the role of government? You know, a lot of our folks might have distrust because of the experiences that we've seen. So sort of how do you navigate that? And where do you see the opportunities for both government and communities to work together and actually make energy democracy a reality. Mahalo, and thank you for not calling me a politician. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so my overall philosophy of government is community leads and government supports. Um, government needs to protect community interests and processes from exploitation of this capitalistic system that we find ourselves in. Um, corporations, uh, you know, that um, maximize dividends to their shareholders at the expense of our community's safety uh, by not properly investing in infrastructure, by increasing rates to unaffordable levels, um, you know, not maximizing efficiencies to save on cost uh, and then putting it on the ratepayers. Um, being forced to invest in, um, you know, clean renewable energies by the government uh, because they're unwilling to do it on their own. Um, you know, the as uh, Todd mentioned earlier, that the energy energy corporation um, he has a monopoly on energy here. Um, government's role is to, you know, support improving archaic harmful systems, you know, like the um, utility scale projects that poison our environment, you know, that uh, Ruth is mentioning. On Molokai, we're looking at public ownership of, you know, 20% of our en energy demands here on Molokai. And uh, this first project, the CBRE, uh, Community-Based Renewable Energy Project, uh, is, is going to include folks with low to moderate income, uh, renters, you know, those who don't own their own property, so um, do not have the decision-making power to install rooftop solar, for example. And with the support that we've um, received, um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to um, reduce the costs to uh, our community members. Um, government should also resource initiatives towards renewable energy projects, um, microgrids. Um, we developed a climate action plan that recommends investing in microgrants to support these efforts. And um, government should also modernize policies that support our community's efforts toward things like wheeling uh, for decentralizing, uh, for microgrids and nanogrids, rooftop solar, but also, uh, you know, solar that's not necessarily on uh, rooftop. And I forget what it's called right now, but I'm sure Todd can say it. <laughs> um, you know, but so funding policies um, and, and, you know, facilitating um, discussions uh, as, you know, a council member, you know, I, sometimes I have access to uh, those that have access to other funding than the federal government, for example, and then bringing those people here, bringing different partners here so that uh, our, our community is empowered, that our community, um, our, our ideas, you know, come to life. Um, so that I think that's the the role that um, those in government uh, should play. Mahalo. Thanks so much, Kiani. And yeah, I mean, I think when when we think of how much money and resources do exist, right? But how they're mismanaged, how they we just don't have access to them. Um, I think 
for a lot of us, it, it sort of brings the alarm that communities should be leading that, that communities should have a seat at the table, um, and that those funds, be it federal or state or even local, should actually be funding sort of energy and just the communities that we actually deserve. Um, Todd, I want to bring it to you, of course. We've been talking a lot about just like all things energy democracy, um, and, but specifically, I think all of y'all have been highlighting this Point, this piece of local control um, over energy and like energy decisions and energy choices to sort of combat these energy monopolies. So I guess for you, like, why is that so important? And how do you feel like the Oahu Energy Cooperatives is an example of that? Great question. I, I love, I really love why questions. So thank you for all the why questions. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to start off by, you know, just telling a, a short little story. About 15 years ago, um, it was announced in uh, Hawaii state media that uh, our local, our, our statewide utility uh, would be making Molokai the first Hawaiian island to be 100% renewable. And uh, it was a surprise to us, uh, no, no consultation or anything else, obviously. Um, and, you know, their, their target date for that was 2020. Uh, so here we are four years later, and uh, we are like 15% uh, renew renewable uh, just because of rooftop solar. There's not a single grid scale project here on the island. So, you know, simply put, if we don't do this ourselves, the same system of extraction, whether it's extracting oil or extracting the people, um, it, it's it's just going to continue. And And if we don't help ourselves, no one else is going to help us. Uh, you have to remember, uh, Hawaii has over 200 years of history of, of being colonized by missionaries and others that, you know, are really just after uh, resources. And so the why is because we have, I would say, you know, that that moral intent um, to do it the right way. And, and, and when I say right, I mean, right by the land and, and right by the people. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, and I want to say the most important reason is um, for us to all be examples of community indigenous success in energy is because people here are ready. Um, I think the world is ready. Um, and under the current burden of energy oppression, you know, we, we all need, uh, we all need inspiration. We all need a model of, of hope um, that shows us that, that we can. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think in terms of that, it, it makes our work all the more uh, important because we might only be working for a population of 7,000 people, um, but we are 65% indigenous here on Molokai, right? And um, we realize this isn't necessary rocket science in terms of the technology, um, but you know the real work, um, the, the, the real hard part is, uh, is not necessarily the technology, but how do you connect uh, the most vulnerable people um, to, to that, that technology? And I, I th think that's the broken promise of uh, renewables up to, to this point. And it's really up to the small, vulnerable communities like us to, to fight like hell, um, you know, to, to make it successful, um, to make it work for us. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but it, it's just it's not worth waiting around for somebody else to figure it out. We have to do it ourselves. Yeah, I love those reminders, Todd, because I think, you know, I can, I, I know I don't only speak for myself, but I think I, as an organizer, have found um, hope and optimism and sort of energy by seeing some of the work that you all have done in some of the hardest conditions and same for our Puerto Rican comrades as well. And, you know, it, it is true. I think it's, you're not just building a model for maybe 7,000 residents. There's people of oppressed and colonized communities all over the world, also looking to one another and reflecting off of one another on strategies on how do we actually build power against all odds. So I really appreciate that reminder. I wanna, you know, I've gotten to ask a lot of questions um, and there are some questions that folks have already answered and I wanna kind of pose them to you all. 
and have also want to encourage folks that are listening in and tuning in that now is a great time to drop in your questions in the Q and A box so we can have our brilliant panelists answer those before we move into some closing reflections. Um, I think the first question um, is Ruth. Um, the question is from Mirna Morales. Thank you for all your work. Weren't there fires happening at the Luma power plants in 2019? And Ruth, if you could just maybe talk a little bit on who Luma is for folks that don't know. Sure. Thank you for the question, Mirna. Um, so Luma Energy is a joint venture created by Qantas Services and Echo Canadian Utilities, two big companies that lobbied heavily after Hurricane Maria to get um, this historic amount of disaster recovery funding from uh, FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, to use to uh, restore power, both that and there's an emergency section of it and, and there's a, a permanent works. And LUMA um, was created to basically, um, and this is in the statements to investors, right? Um, that the, the the company put out to take advantage of this historic amount of funding that's available for the Puerto Rico electric system, which started with about 9.6 billion with a B and is now up to about 19.3 or so billion. And that does not include some new funding that is just coming in for so-called uh, temporary but new gas fire generation units. Um, so, you know, the company saw a huge business opportunity and yes, they decided to come in. It was a newly created company and these, the two parent uh, corporations are really, they're transmission and distribution companies, especially build um, long distance, high voltage transmission lines in the US and Canada and the continents. Um, and had no experience uh, in an island context. Um, and But they did, they were granted the contract um, to operate the, the transmission and distribution systems here in Puerto Rico. And we now talk about Hurricane Luma because the service has been, uh, you know, Mirna mentions the fires at the substations. Uh, we also need to talk about the power outages, just as bad or worse than we had before this privatization. We now have a new, whole new problem that I barely was aware of before, which has to do with voltage fluctuations and damaging, for example, hospital equipment and um, and just household appliances throughout. It's, it's another disaster that's upon us. Um, and as Kiani mentioned in her first statements, we, um, that reinforces the need to relate to energy in a different way, um, in a holistic way, and become and and empower uh, ourselves as communities and people here and residents of Puerto Rico to become agents of of, of change in this energy uh, sector. Thanks for that, Ruth. I see some more questions coming in. Um, there's there's one, and I, I don't want to put any of y'all on the on the spot because this is a bit of a complex question. But I think all of y'all have some reflections on this. Um, uh, Tanette Devo, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, asked, "How do you promote energy democracy when there's already a publicly owned utility that's not serving the public good? Is there room for well-meaning small renewable companies that are privately owned?" <laughs> I I want to take that question. Um, is is there room? Uh, I I would say the way that business is done right now in the energy market, um, it, it it it's not meant for the little guys. It's not meant for the communities. Um, and there really isn't a, a lot of room. I would say. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there. Um, I, I I've heard you know, Ruth talk about disasters. Um, and we just saw what happened to the neighboring island on Maui, the big fires that they had out there. 
um, I, I look at these big disruptive um, uh, natural disasters and, and similar things. And oftentimes it takes those things uh, to really shift um, the bigger picture. And uh, unfortunately, um, there are victims in, in those processes. But, you know, I, I look towards technology and uh, it's within technology, there is an opportunity for disruption. Right. And I, I look towards uh, that uh, disruptive behavior of technology as a potential for the natural for uh, the same potential as a natural disaster. Right. And in terms of um, monopolistic, um, you know, utility uh, such as what we have here, Hawaii Electric, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll just ask a question, you know, is there uh, a, a, a moment that can be very disruptive for the utility, um, but not necessarily disruptive for um, the, you know, our community or end users, right? Um, and, and I think that time is coming. Uh, you see the cost of especially rooftop inverters, storage uh, panels, uh, all of those prices continue to drop and drop. Uh, and already it is much faster, much easier, quicker, to bring electricity to where the people are, bring it to their homes, right? And if you can do that um, much better uh, than the utility does, you have an opportunity to create disruption, right? And if you are supporting the poorest uh, portions of your community first, when that disruptive, uh, when that disruption takes place, your most vulnerable are already supported with the renewable systems and, and you know, other projects and whatnot. So anyway, um, kind of going down a rabbit hole, but, you know, I, I think that if you, if we're all, if we band together, if we can continue to share our uh, examples of success and we can be strategic, it takes strategic strategy and bold leadership, courageous leadership in order to make things like this happen. But uh, I think the opportunity is there right now. Exciting. And yeah, we know that even in crises, there's room for opportunities for transformation. Um, Want to pass it? I think this question, I don't think it's just for you, Ruth. I think all of y'all, but Yanni Murray asked Are there any plans or talks about combating against corrupt solar companies that make it impossible for disadvantaged communities to afford switching to solar and holding these companies accountable? Hey, so um, thanks for the question, Yanni. Um, yeah, I, I um, let's see, I guess I'll stick with the hurricane model, right? And um, so we also have, in addition to the so-called natural hurricanes, as I mentioned, we have the Hurricane Luma, we also have a Hurricane Sonova, um, which is a rooftop solar company, for-profit company that has, uh, implemented the most predatory business practices you can imagine. Um, the, one of the things that they did, for example, was that um, they started selling systems here in Puerto Rico, uh, a solar system, solar panels, um, or leasing them, I should say better. It's, it's a lease agreement, like 25 year leases for solar panels prior to, her, to the hurricanes that were not coupled with batteries. And because this was something new, um, people did not realize that they would not have power if the main grid was down and they did not have batteries. But Sonova, of course, knew this and did it anyway. And then after Hurricane Maria, when people did not have power because they did not have batteries, Sonova was charging people for energy service that they were not receiving, right? So um, very problematic um, business practices that we've seen with lots of private enterprises. And um, this is why we advocate for the reforming of our public utility and being able to provide universal access to distributed renewable energy, life potentially life-saving energy on rooftops nearby in on parking lots, et cetera, um, so that people will not be without power and will not be uh, you know, victims of these predatory businesses, which is what we've seen. That's been our experience. 
Yes, Keanu, please. Mahalo. I, I wanted to add a, a, a little story, um, kind of a, a big victory for Molokai. Um, so the Public Utilities Commission, the State Public Utilities Commission governs um, energy as a utility in Hawaii. And when the um, community-based renewable energy, uh, which was um, the RFP, which was mandated by the government, was put out, um, the you know energy monopoly, uh, Hawaii Electric, Hawaiian Electric, uh, attempted to bid on this RFP uh, against the communities group that was intending to um, put in a bid for the RFP. Um, the R oh sorry, RFP stands for Request for Proposal um, for this larger scale uh, solar project, and. Our community, um, you know, with Ho'ahu and uh, Clean Energy Hui, um, with other partners uh, that really helped us gain our uh, energy literacy, uh, went to the PUC, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, um, and advocated for ourselves, for our community, that uh, th this was not right. This was not the spirit and intention of the government for Hiko to build this uh, energy, um, you know, this so solar panel, uh, solar farm uh, itself, uh, especially since there was a viable group in the community intending to do it itself. Um, and uh, in that PUC hearing, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that victory to our community, uh, and uh, Hiko Hawaiian Electric. Uh, withdrew its intention to put in a self-build team to bid on it itself on this project. Uh, and the group that remained was Ho'ahu. Um, and we're on our way. Our community is on its way to um, owning that project. Yes, thank you for sharing just like those concrete wins that I don't think we should downplay that have like this long-term impact of, um, yeah, especially in these bidding processes that we know are so rigged and usually always go to the big foreign corporation. And, you know, there's a lot of backdoor deals. And Ruth, I also wanted to affirm, you know, you talked about how this is also sort of potentially life-saving, you know, um, energy. And and I I re recall seeing what was happening in Puerto Rico when hospitals were losing um, energy and, and didn't have power and older folks weren't able to actually, you know, use their device, their medical devices because of no energy. So I just want to affirm like how it, it really is a, a, a matter of life affirming in every way and life-saving. Um, I think we'll have time for maybe one more question, which I think any of y'all would be amazing at answering, but anonymous question. Thank you all for sharing your perspective on community needs and government responsibilities. As an anti-capitalist organizer focused on removing lead service lines in a primarily black community, I would like to know if you think there's any way to ethically work with or have the same dynamic between communities and the private sector. I struggle with this and would be interested in understanding your insight. <laughs> I, I really forgot to highlight and mention the fact that Oahu, in parallel of this, you know, community uh, solar project, uh, has created a, a workforce. Um, we, in the past three years, we've had three cohorts, uh, and you know, we have about a dozen students a year, and most of those students are Hawaiian, uh, and many of them live off grid. And what it's done, which which Ruth has talked about, you know, the the importance of, you know, in, in terms of energy awareness, um, we now have this small army of people on our island that know so much more about electricity. They're active, they're engaged. And I think workforce is a really great way to engage your local community. Um, you know, people who are hungry for work, people who are hungry for knowledge. Um, you know, get them involved, create that workforce that's from within the community. Um, and as they become active, as, as they become those people who do those jobs and make those decisions, they will advocate. 
you know, for the integrity of their community. I, I truly believe that. And I just wanted to add uh, that in, in case it wasn't clear earlier that Ho'ahu is uh, not a for-profit, it, it's a co-op. Um, and, and that the workforce um, initiative that Todd is talking about, um, some, some of that funding came from the county. So when I was talking earlier about resourcing our community through grants um, so that we are truly empowering our own community to, to control our destiny, to, to own, manage, maintain, repair our own projects, um, you know, all of these things. Thanks y'all for that. I feel like I'm learning so much and I feel like I'm continuously learning from y'all's work. Um, I, unfortunately, we don't have all day as amazing this has been. And I want to sort of maybe pivot a little bit to some closing um, reflections, you know, in, in this webinar, in this conversation, y'all have talked about um, really hard things, right? We're talking about extraction and that creates a lot of trauma and and hardship in our communities it's also we're up against some some serious opponents right like some powerful corporations and some really corrupt systems so we've talked about a lot of challenging things um and i think the work that organizers do and community leaders do is is tiring it's thankless in a lot of ways and it's exhausting and i'm curious for each of y'all sort of looking ahead, where does your sort of like the seeds of hope lie for you right now? Yeah, Keanu, you wanna kick us off? Mahalo. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for this question. When we, um, you know, picked up and continued this effort on Molokai uh, years ago, uh, we didn't know what it would look like today. Um, you know, in, in spite of the detractors in, and colonial forces um, and, and years of other people telling a story about Molokai that wasn't true, um, but told to force us to, to assimilate and to give up our resources, a story that sought to extinguish our light and our spirit. Um, this story was necessary to get us to support proposed projects that wasn't in our community's best interest. Like the project Kanoho Helm spearheaded the fight against. The big wind project that proposed to build massive windmills uh, on, on Hawaiian homestead land that would kill off native seabirds and that would connect um, to Oahu, the neighboring island, uh, through an undersea cable, and all of that energy would not come to Molokai. It would go away, leaving us the burden uh, and environmental injustice and imp negative impacts to benefit someone somewhere else. Um, you know, this, this project sought to exploit us. And now we are telling our own story, um, a story of the brilliance of our ancestors. A story of resilient, a resilient and abundant future that includes energy, land back, water back, food independence. Um, and you know, I'm constantly inspired by Auntie Laurie Buchanan, Todd, and his brother Matt, um, and and so many others who continued to question those for years who sought to. Um, exploit our island for their own profits without any community consultation. Um, folks like Leilani Chow, who spearheaded uh, this work of um, Molokai Community Energy uh, Resiliency Action Plan. Um, and, you know, our, our community, like, like Ruth was saying, um, regarding energy literacy. We, when we first started, we didn't know energy, but a group of us met twice a year for over a year to become energy literate. And now it said, nobody knows energy and the grid like Molokai. And, and this has turned 
uh, in turn reignited the light for other communities that have been saddled with the burdens and environmental and energy injustice. And, and we have served as a model for others. And our community is so happy to help, such as Waianae on Oahu and Lahaina on Maui. Lifting each other as we rise always gives me hope. And hope is contagious. Giving hope to others has been the greatest gift for me because it all starts with hope. Mahalo. Thank so you, much. Jenny. So um, what gives me hope is that um, we can see now that this is doable, that the radical transformation of the electric system in Puerto Rico um, is doable on not just the te technological level, but also um, watching communities, organized communities who a few years ago knew nothing about solar energy, do a rooftop solar project and run it um, is amazing and um, certainly provides a lot of hope as, as Kenny um, said. I mean, there, we have, we're facing tremendous challenges, but it, every day it's clear that um, what our captured public utility is doing and captured by big private corporations um, that I guess contribute to campaign funds, et cetera, um, is not in the public interest. And that we're getting a clearer view of what is. And we've got civil society proposals, not just um, queremos sol, we want sun, others, right? Where people are sort of talking the same language, speaking about the, the transformation involving you know, organized communities and the public sector and that the huge amount of public funds and just having every element present um, except the politicians online to make it move in that direction. Um, and I guess, yeah, that means we we certainly have to work harder, but but I think um, we have a lot more hope that that this can be done. Um, I, I, I run on hope. <laughs> it's all, I don't have very much in my life. Um, but I, I, yeah, I survive on hope. Um, my hope is that the status quo, um, that is in energy right now is, uh, that we, that people like us are able to shift it. The status quo right now is that the energy is for the privilege. Energy is all about extraction. Um, and, you know, I I, um, I I realize this work that Kiana and I have described that that Molokai has done in the past two or three years that it's it's really been, if you were to to really look at it in a nutshell, we've we've really reverse engineered how the re request for proposal project, uh, you know, works. Um, um, what we've essentially done is we've put the community first. We've put the community at the top, right? We've we've told um, our leaders and our people from the community up, this is what our needs are. Um, this is what is acceptable for us. And these are what our strategies are. Um, and so my hope is that um, this becomes a new status quo um, because it makes sense. Um, and, and, and my... My other hope is that, you know, this, I come from an, a family of engineers. Um, I, I ended up being an artist. I don't know why, but, um, you know, what my father and my grandfather told, have taught me about engineering is engineering is not about electricity and all those technical things. Uh, engineers, it, you know, at their, at their base uh, are, are there to help people and to solve problems. Um, and it's my hope that energy and renewable energy is, is able um, to reshift itself towards those uh, super important uh, qualities that support our communities and everyone else. Um, and I think we're getting there. So that's it. Thank you. Yes. Ruth, Todd, Kiani, just want to express deep, deep, deep gratitude. I'm, you know, I'm in awe because I think on one end, you guys have been able to describe very concrete strategies 
on what it is they actually mean to build power against, you know, these big corporations, against the status quo. Um, on another front, I think you all are very much sort of embodying like so much of the ancestral wisdom and knowledge of what it means to protect community, of uh, be in right relationship with one another and the land. And I think on this front of hope, I feel very much inspired with hope and optimism when I hear you all speak and when I learn more about the work that all of you lead and are up to. Um, and it also reminds me that, yes, as as calcified as the status quo is, as powerful as these corporations are, at the same time, I think we're in a very historical moment where status quo is also trembling, right? I think we're all seeing that each day that passes, each year that passes. And I think the bold leadership and sort of just organization that all of you all are up to is, is not only necessary, I think it's just gonna be what transforms the possibility of status quo to more liberation. So I really wanna thank you all. Um, for everyone that tunes in from wherever you are, thank you all for joining. Stay connected with us at Partners for Dignity and Rights. Stay connected with New Social Contract. Please follow the work of all our amazing panelists. Um, this is one of many conversations we'll continue to have around the amazing topics and thank you all. Hey. hey, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice Love to see you all. Good to see you. Bye. -bye.